my name is Daniel Maynard. I'm the director of the DPAC HBCU Mentoring Program. And, um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad those of you who joined were able to join so far. And I believe this will be uh, a fantastic opportunity for you to hear directly from persons in, you know, in these different careers. All right, so the purpose of this particular um, workshop is to sort of consider some careers that might not necessarily be medical school or a PhD for biomed. So a lot of the other workshops were focused on, you know, summer programs or, you know, medical specialties and so forth. And those are great. If that's what you want to do, absolutely continue on that track. But there are many persons who are doing STEM majors, biochemistry, um, et cetera, who might not necessarily want to be a physician um, or you might not want to do a PhD in, in um, biomedical research. And there are actually plenty of career opportunities that will pay well and that would allow you to use your STEM background um, and, and could also leave room for a lot of creativity for you to bring in other skills besides just the science. So this is a list and this is not exhaustive. There are many other careers. But this is a list of uh, careers you can, can have that do not require a doctoral degree. So some you can do with a bachelor's straight of, of undergrad. Some you may need a, a master's degree. Um, but you can go into these various careers and start off making a, a pretty decent salary. Some you can sort of go through the ranks and, and build and do other things. Some you might decide this is what you want to do um, for the long term. But I just wanted to sort of spotlight some of these um, careers that I you know when I was an undergrad, I didn't know a medical physicist existed because I really liked physics. I probably would have done that. I'd be making a pretty, pretty good salary right now. Um, and there's so many options in nursing as well uh, that are specialized uh, that can uh, pay well and can allow you to, um, to find what you think you might enjoy doing. There are also a number of other specialties that have doctoral programs that are not necessarily med school or a PhD. And the earlier you know about these, and the better you can prepare for applying for them, like a doctor of audiology, which we'll probably hear a bit about today, uh, dentistry, uh, um, podiatry, I think is one that I did not know much about, but uh, these are, are a specialist um, that, that also do quite well. And, and so, yeah, there are many options and the more you explore, uh, the more you might surprise yourself and find something that you hadn't thought about that might be a really good fit for you. And we'll try to cover as many of these in the following series, this particular um, series. But of course, if there's something you're interested in and you've never met somebody who does it or you've kind of only seen it on TV, shoot me an email and I will scout. I will find somebody and bring them on, on this panel. Some of the panelists could attest to that. All right, so we're going to hand over to uh, Mr. Darius Thomas, and he's going to tell us a bit about the audiology, speech, language pathology, um, and here in science world. All righty, thank you so much for having me today. I'll share my screen and do a brief introduction. All right, hello everyone. My name is Darius Thomas. I'm the founder and CEO of Dynamic Therapy. I currently reside in Atlanta, Georgia. However, I went to Howard University for my undergraduate and my master's degree. I am a licensed speech language pathologist. We service clients in six states and in Europe. And so if you're interested in being a speech pathologist and potentially an audiologist, this presentation is for you. All right, so we're gonna talk about a rewarding career that you can have within this respective industry. All right, so what is communication science and disorders? Well, that's the discipline. Now, after you major in communication science and communication sciences and disorders, you can choose a career path. You can choose audiology or speech language pathology. Now, when you think of audiology, you think of hearing. When you think of speech, of course, you think of the words that's coming out of your mouth. But we're going to dive deeper into what that can consist of. You also can be a hearing scientist while considering being a, going into communication sciences and disorders. So you all will have these slides following this presentation, but I would love for you to be able to review how representation matters within my respective field. You will notice that in the industry of communication sciences and disorders, it's about one to 3% African-American and or minority, and as well with males. So typically there's one of me amongst 25,000 Caucasian women. Right. So that's like giving you like demographics. And so if you are a minority, I highly encourage you to look at the industry of speech and language pathology 
because we need people to represent their clients and clients need to see people that look like them. Right. So picture yourself making a difference. When you're a speech pathologist or audiologist, you're making an impact in your community. You get to improve quality of life. You get to provide clinical services, conduct research, supervise, and manage services. You can work in a plethora of settings, i.e. the hospital, a nursing home, a school system. You can work in private practice. You can also do home health for your service clients in their own respective homes. Nearly one in 12 children ages three to 17 have a disorder related to voice, speech, language, or swallowing. And so it is important for us to continue to recruit speech language pathologists and audiologists. All right, what are the benefits to a career in communication sciences and disorders? You can earn a good living with excellent benefits in job security. There are a plethora of jobs for speech pathologists. If you just Google speech pathology or audiology job right now, you will see hundreds of them. And so you will always have a job, no matter the setting that you want to practice in. There's job availability and US News and World Report highly ranks audiology and speech language pathology jobs. And I would say it's because we get to make an impact in the lives of people daily. Now, who you'll work with, you can choose to work with all of the above. However, you can specialize in babies or children or teens or even adults. At my practice at Dynamic Therapy, we service clients womb to tomb. Birth to 100 is typically what I'll say, but we can see clients amongst the lifespan. Where you'll work and what you will do. So as a speech pathologist or, audit, or an audiologist, you can work at the collegiate level as a professor doing research. You can work in colleges and universities. You can work amongst corporations. You can work in healthcare. The options are far beyond what you can ever imagine. There are some people that's even venturing out into becoming forensic speech pathologists, where they go into the courtrooms to highlight evidence-based practice and things regarding their clients or people that have court cases related to speech and language services. What is an audiologist? Audiologists are healthcare professionals who provide patient-centered care in the provision, identification, diagnosis, and evidence-based treatment of hearing, balance, and other auditory disorders for people of all ages. Hearing loss is the third most common physical condition okay, after arthritis. And so I want to note that audiologists are so needed. Audiologists have a lot of options. Okay? There are so many settings that they can also work in, like the clinical private settings, similar to speech pathologists. They can serve as a college professor. They can be on a medical team. They can develop leading research. And so if you love research, this would be a good path to follow. But you have options. Why an audiology career? One in five teens suffer from hearing loss. Three in five veterans returning from war suffer from hearing loss. While being an audiologist, you can also work with the federal government or the military to support those that have been impacted. Okay? All right, in 2018, the median salary report for ASHA certified audiologists. ASHA is our American Speech Language Hearing Association. This is our national association that guides our policies and procedures within our respective industry. But you'll see how things fared out with audiologists and PhDs, okay, in the salaries with university faculty and administrators, and then how salary ranges between women and men which is something that we need to modify and change. All right, to be an ASHA certified audiologist, you need to one, earn a bachelor's degree, earn an AUD degree, okay, a doctorate degree in audiology, complete an externship and pass your national exam. These are all things that you can do over the course of a few years and with patience and dedication. All right, what is a speech language pathologist? I am a speech language pathologist, so I'm happy to share that. We're healthcare professionals who identify, assess, and treat speech language and swallowing disorders, preventing and treating communication disorders in people of all ages. So I typically say speech pathologists assess, diagnose, and treat speech and language disorders. Example given a client with an articulation deficit, maybe they're producing tat instead of cat, or maybe they're saying wabbit instead of rabbit. 
right? We may support them with articulation deficits, or we may support clients with fluency disorders. The example given if they're having whole word repetitions, like my, my, my name is Darius, right? We can support, counsel, and help our clients achieve their goals. And that's very rewarding. SLPs have a lot of options. We can manage a university or hospital speech and hearing clinic. You want to be the boss? You can serve patients in your private practice. You can start your own business. You can help employees improve communication with customers. You can help musicians and singers maintain their voice. We also do vocal coaching. Okay? We also can do public speaking coaching. Now, those would be elective services, but we're able to help those clients. We also can work with trans clients, right? So there are many different things that we can do, and you're able to specialize in many different areas within communication sciences and disorders. Why a career in speech language pathology? About 930,000 people in the United States have Parkinson's disease. Approximately 17.9 million adults in the US have trouble using their voices. There is a major need for those in this room. Again, you will see some videos amongst this PowerPoint. Once you have access to it, feel free to watch these videos. Here you'll see the 2020 school salary report for speech language pathologists. Okay. And you'll see it ranging anywhere between $60,000 to the upper $90,000. However, note that your salary can continue to go up and up and up based off your years of experience and the settings of which you're working. All right, again, here is a salary information sheet on speech pathologists in the healthcare setting, all ranging from the near $80,000 mark up to the 110 mark. Okay. To be an ASHA certified speech language pathologist, you need to one, earn a bachelor's degree, two, earn a master's degree from a CAA accredited program, three, complete a clinical fellowship. And then four, pass the national exam to practice. Now, you can become a speech pathology assistant. So right after you major in speech pathology in undergrad or communication sciences and disorders in undergrad, you can go out and become a speech pathology assistant. However, if you want to be a full speech pathologist, right, an ASHA certified speech pathologist, you need to complete your master's program, your clinical fellowship, and pass the national exam. Now, what is a speech, language, and hearing sciences? These people are healthcare professionals who conduct research into the normal functions of human communication, the processes underlying impaired function, and the development of new techniques for assessment and treatment. Mm. All right. Speech, language, and hearing sciences have a lot of options as well. They can collaborate with related professionals, such as audiologists, speech language pathologists like myself, engineers, physicians, Right In the world of communication sciences and disorders, we love to collaborate with other professionals. For example, speech pathologists may collaborate with social workers, mental health counselors, physical therapists, occupational therapists. So the world is your oyster. And you're able to collaborate and build a community. You can work as a researcher in communication processes, new treatments. You can work as a university professor to train the next generation of clinicians. So many options exist. The salary information for speech language and human sciences, it varies widely depending on your experience, the work setting, and your geographical location. Let's all try to increase diversity in communication sciences and disorders. We would love to have more bilingual service providers. And imagine, as a bilingual service provider, you can get paid more. We would love to increase underrepresented racial and ethnic backgrounds within the world of speech pathology and audiology, as well as we need more males. It's very rare that you see a male, especially African-American male speech pathologist. And so we need more diversity. And so I hope today that you all will consider researching communication sciences and disorders and becoming a speech pathologist or audiologist or a speech language and hearing scientist. So from these videos, you'll see more people that exhibit diversity, promoting the careers in hearing scientists, speech language pathology, as well as audiology.
The need for bilingual clinicians. The top 10 most common languages nationally in healthcare encounters requiring interpretation are Spanish, okay? Languages commonly spoken in China, in China, Mandarin and Cantonese, et cetera. And so if you speak any of those languages, it will be great to have you a part of this community. Steps for undergraduates preparing for graduate school. If you're looking to become a speech pathologist or audiologist, it's important to choose a graduate program accredited by the CAA and review admission and program requirements. Next, you want to visit those communication sciences and disorders programs, talk with faculty and students about the curriculum, research interests, clinical education opportunities. Okay, so you can see what they're all about. And then select the best program that meets your needs. And then you can establish personal criteria to determine what is important to you. And then you can visit the underground road, the undergrad, not underground. You can visit the undergrad roadmap to explore the three pathways that will lead you to graduate school. All right, and then you'll be able to click that hyperlink from this slide. All righty. Next, you can identify undergraduate and graduate communication sciences and disorders program. You can visit ED Fine, Ed Fine to search institutions and to review admission and program requirements for undergraduate and graduate CSD programs. You can browse by a variety of options like study abroad opportunities, online or distant learning. There are online master's programs in speech pathology. You can browse based off location. You can think about cultural or bilingual emphasis. Okay, so many options there. What's next? To learn more about audiology and speech language pathology careers, you can visit hearingandspeechcareers.org to visit the stories of CSD students and professionals. You may find me on one of those videos. You can take the quiz to find out which career path is best for you, audiology, speech language pathology, okay, speech language and hearing scientists. You can view and print out the roadmaps. You can even order career brochures if you work in a facility where maybe you want to promote this industry to other people. All right, as we get ready to wrap up, about ASHA. ASHA is our American Speech Language Hearing Association. It is the National Professional Scientific and Credentialing Association for 223,000 members and affiliates who are audiologists, speech language pathologists, speech language and hearing scientists, audiology and speech language pathology support personnel and students. Okay, and so this is our national accrediting body for speech pathology and audiology. I thank you all so much for listening to me today. I look forward to hearing any of your questions. However, if you don't have a question exactly today, here's my contact information. Again, I'm Darius Thomas. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And you can find my email address here. And if you have any further questions, maybe long-term about having a career in speech pathology or audiology or anything within communication sciences and disorders, you're also able to email careers at asha.org as they would love to support you as well. Thank you all so much for your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Darius, for that. I mean, that was very informative and I'm sure the students learned quite a bit. So we're gonna move on now to Abba Roberts, who is um, a clinical laboratory scientist here at Johns Hopkins. And we'll hear what she has to say. I think I shared my screen correctly, right? Can you see my slides yes. now? Okay. Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ave Roberts. I am a clinical laboratory scientist at Johns Hopkins Hospital, and I work in the microbiology lab. Um, so what is clinical laboratory sciences? Um, it's also known as when your doctor says they're going to send a specimen, a biological specimen from you to the lab. I'm usually at the other end of that. Um, so it's also called medical laboratory science or medical technology. Um, we provide the information that is needed for diagnosis, treatment, and management of um, most of the diseases. 70% of the medical decisions that your clinician or provider make are based off of laboratory testing um, and that is the area that I specialize in. So what do we do? Um, laboratory professionals uh, 
detect, diagnose, treat, monitor. Uh, we work in hospitals, uh, clinics, doctor's office, um, urgent care, research. Even I think we had um, uh, some laboratory scientists work on the side of in your veterinarian's office, um, had a position uh, at the aquarium at one point. Um, so you're, you're looking at all of the laboratory things that you can get to diagnose a case. Um, there are about 260,000 certified laboratories in the country where we do 14 billion laboratory tests um, annually. Um, so the laboratory is divided into four sections. So you have transfusion medicine, which is blood banking, where you would do cross-matching for blood types and transfusions. We have the core lab, which is based off of chemistry, hematology, which we're doing cell counting and looking for uh, cancers, leukemias, um, heart disease, and other medical conditions to go with body chemistry. Uh, immunology, where we're looking at um, a more autoimmune diseases. And my specialty, which is medical microbiology. Um, and this is where we're looking at bacterial, viral, fungal um, issues um, and some parasites. Uh, our laboratory is divided into several sections, which are culture labs and non-culture labs. Um, these are actual pictures from some of my coworkers that I have in the lab today. Um, we work in specimen processing, AFB, which we're looking at tuberculosis um, and Ebola which is more of those uh, BS level three type of organisms um, that can be in the air. As you can see, uh, coworker Kim has the correct PPE on for that. Um, bacteriology, which we're looking at urine, wound, sputum, stool cultures to make sure that we can find the bacteria. Um, molecular, which we are looking for the viral load and or detection of a virus. Um, we can do the viral load of HCV, um, people who have that disease for management, um, also for HIV. Um, we also look for uh, viruses like VZV, which is uh, your simple um, varicella vi virus or chickenpox, as you would call it. Um, mycology, we're looking for fungus um, and uh, yeast in different body sites. Um, and we also have a little bit of a specialization with our rapid response area, which mainly does viruses, but in a quicker time, um, that would be some of our RSV, flu, and COVID testing. Um, uh, special micro, which we're looking at antibiotic management of all of the lab, all of the uh, different areas combined to see um, what is the best bug drug um, combination through those areas and uh, which our newest lab, which is our next generation sequencing or NGS. Um, this is when we are looking at the actual genome of the organism instead of looking at um, diagnostics on auger and um, older kind of technology. Uh, we also look for in um, molecular epidemiology case, which is working with NGS now um, as hospital outbreaks of viruses. So we're looking at where did that start? Um, you can think of that as um, MRSA or VRE in the NICU or something to that nature. So these are the main areas that we have in our lab. Um, so some of the pros and cons of the job. So we can work in a lot of um, interesting cases. Um, Monkeypox was just uh, out. Uh, one of my colleagues developed a PCR test to help develop that. I was on the team to do the first COVID testing um, within the state of Maryland. That was an in-house test before we had different platforms for COVID. Um, so it's always interesting cases and new technologies that we will bring forth with that. Um, you have the opportunity to write papers and do publications, posters for professional societies. Um, for instance, our ASM, um, we have a, a 
viral one, there's ones for chemistry and the like. Um, there's a lot of exposure to growth. So you can start as a technologist, but move on a management track to um, so be a lead, a supervisor, go over QA, QC, quality assurance and control um, within an area or um, our main pathology manager started as a technologist and now he is the pathology administrator um, within the core lab. Uh, there's, this is also a good foundation for other careers. So if you are interested in medical school, nursing school, uh, PA school for pathologist assistant or physician assistant, this is a very good um, foundation if you wanna move on to your, another career. And there's always jobs within the field. Um, you can think of traveling med techs, just like we have uh, the traveling nurses, um, which can make diff, uh, different money as you go to different uh, areas. Some of the cons um, with working in the laboratory is the work schedule. Um, most hospitals are 24 hours, seven days a week, um, every shift. So um, there's times where you can work an overnight shift, the evening shift, the day shift. Um, holidays, um, a lot of inclement weather. I've had the opportunity um, of having to stay in the hospital for a couple of days when we were, had that blizzard in 2006 or seven, I think. Um, there is some isolation for from the patient. So we aren't seeing one patient at a time. We may have 300 urine cultures. So we're seeing multiple patients at a time, but making a big impact in a big way. Um, there are heavy workloads. Um, if you think about the COVID testing, we were doing, I think, 800 tests per day in the height, and that was just within our laboratory, and then we started taking things on from the um, tents, um, so the workloads can um, be heavy, but very rewarding for what we're doing. And then there's a lot of industry changes. So technology changes. Um, if we go back to COVID, we've unloaded 11 different COVID testing platforms at one time um, to help with that demand. So that helped with like a lot of LIS updates, which is our laboratory information system to make sure that the instrumentation that we use will be able to be uploaded to give to the physicians, um, cap inspections, so all of our laboratories are inspected uh, to work well, so that's always um, an issue to make sure that we have procedures written correctly um, and that they adhere to the guidelines that um, are working with all of our areas, specifically in micro. So I think we have um, the drug bug combinations. I'll stop sharing. Um, so if we have drug bug combinations that are available, um, we have guidelines that would help us look into that. And they, since um, a lot of bacteria can change, that ends up creating um, a way that we have to keep repeating um, an area to make sure that we have the right combination for the patient care. Okay. Um, my, my career roadmap, um, I have been interested in science since middle school. So I've joined um, Upward Bound, I graduated, I was working at the Maryland Science Center in the education department. And I started volunteering, volunteering as a in the pediatrician's office, and I realized going on that MD track was not for me. Um, so I decided to get a second bachelor's degree um, to figure out what I wanted to do since that biology uh, medicine track wasn't it. And I started working um, as a specimen processor in the micro lab, did some clinical rotations, um, obtain my um, certification through the American Society of Clinical Pathology. And that's when I began working um, at Hopkins full-time from University of Maryland. Um, I worked within the lab uh, straight for 10 years, did publications, was able to get 
um, awards for ASM, for teaching, career work, um, just having different platforms come in. And so then I decided to take that um, and go into a quality control route um, as a specialist um, with onboarding and doing some of that CLSI work and the CAP work that we talked about. Um, from there, um, COVID really kind of changed the trajectory of my career path where I just started to do more inventory management and procurement. And I actually um, decided during the height of COVID to earn an MBA um, and to work with healthcare supply chain. So I'm just saying this career and this path can put you into a different um, projection of where you wanna go. You don't have to kind of stay um, as a technologist. We do have people who have been a technologist for 40 years, but there's opportunities for growth um, to move into management, to move into um, hospital management. Um, and as for me, I'm moving into supply chain and will graduate in the spring. Um, as a hospital, hospital laboratory professional, there are many avenues that you can take and you can start at any educational level. Um, we have laboratory aides that will have just a GED or um, a high school diploma, um, phlebotomists that work, you know, phlebotomists that are the ones who will take um, the specimen, especially blood. Um, they usually have a certification. Um, our MLTs or clinical laboratory technicians, uh, they have an associate's degree. Um, I think you have somebody talking about his tech, technology in the next one. Um, as a medical laboratory scientist or MLS, um, I have a four-year degree with the certifications and the board certification through ASCP, um, but people also go on to do specialists. So we have specialists in blood banking, specialists in um, molecular um, microbiology and stuff like that. So you can continue on to get those specializations. Um, we also have pathologist assistants which have a master's degree. So you can do more of the growth side of pathology. And we also have our MD track, which um, pathologists will work uh, as an MD. And um, we have faculty members who are over those areas that talk, AFB, uh, mycology and stuff. So they they guide us um, and they have the MD to run the, to run the laboratory. Um, the next thing is that we also have a, a job summer program. Um, so if anybody is, or if you know anybody who's 15 and older, who wants to have um, an internship opportunity um, and just to work on their resume, uh, feel free to look into this program. Um, and that is all I have. And thank you for helping me one of my slides. <laughs> that didn't work. No problem. Thank you so much. That was um, really informational. We have a few questions in the chat, but what we'll do is we'll have um, Jury give her presentation and then we'll come back to all of the questions at the end. Uh, Jury, you're up. All right. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation to, to share and to be a part of um, this panel of uh, dynamic, dynamic folks doing great work. Um, I'm Jerry Cotman. I'm a licensed clinical social worker um, and integrative mental health therapist practicing in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, yes, dynamic, right? <laughs> um, didn't realize the pun that I, I did there. Um, but I am the owner and lead therapist at AFIA Counseling and Wellness Services uh, located in Baltimore, Maryland. And AFIA is a Swahili word that means complete wellness. And that is the goal and the focus of the work that I do in my practice. Um, and so my, my goal and my intention is always to help individuals become and connect with their healthiest selves. And so um, through my work with integrative um, integrative nutrition and my body medicine. I support my clients in um, balancing their, their mind and their body into becoming and feeling healthier. Um, and so I don't have um, slides to progress through because I really just wanted to be able to share my journey and share my story. 
um, and how I landed in this field. Uh, I never would have imagined that I would be working as a mental health therapist and clinical therapist um, when I think back to where my journey started. I attended uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County or UMBC uh, for my undergraduate degree. I got my undergrad degree in sociology, minoring in social work and Africana studies. And during that time, I also um, decided that I wanted to help people. That was the big goal. That was the big intention um, of, of, of uh, pursuing my degree, uh, which is really just to be a uh, a helper in the helping tradition. I had no idea what that really entailed or what that would mean, but I knew that that was something that was important to me. Um, I went on to receive my master's degree from Morgan State University, um, and I have my concentration. Um, my master's is in social work with a concentration in public health. Uh, so my goal was to continue to understand um, the larger landscape of uh, the type of health and public health issues that show up in our city and really understanding, um, connecting the dots around how we get from um, sickness and illness to healthy and thriving. Um, and I was surrounded in, in my, not only in my city, but also in my home, um, had a mother with uh, some chronic illnesses and was always curious about how uh, her history, her background may have influenced the way she was treated in hospital settings. Uh, so my goal was to be a medical or hospital uh, social worker. So my first, uh, the first clinical work that I did out of grad school was working um, in HIV services um, in a clinic in Baltimore. Um, and I did that for about three years. Um, it was really rewarding work. Uh, in my role as a mental health coordinator, what I did was I bridged the gap between um, HIV services um, helping individuals who were coming in just to have their conditions managed and treated um, to consider and be open to mental health treatment if that was something that they needed. Uh, so I got to have some really rich conversations with people who maybe had never considered seeing a therapist, who had never thought about talking with someone about their problems or um, having some outside or additional support. And um, I was the, the face of, of the mental health services um, for that time. And I was really grateful for um, that experience because I went into it really hoping to be that connector. And it started that way and it ended up seeing clients because people um, formed relationships with me. And so um, that was a really rich and rewarding experience. Um, and I took that uh, experience working in HIV services to go into an administrative position um, as a program director uh, for a local nonprofit uh, that focused on serving individuals living and thriving with HIV and AIDS. Um, and then I realized that I really missed working with the people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and from that time, I did some work in outpatient mental health clinics and later decided that I was going to uh, open my own private practice, uh, which I did in March of 2017. Uh, and so since then, uh, my work has evolved to working one-on-one -on -one with clients, um, to again, doing individual counseling, um, to doing groups, uh, doing workshops, doing training, teaching, um, all centered on how we can use um, integrative work or just, again, mind-body connection work in the treating and addressing of mental, um, mental illness and mental health concerns. Um, and so my latest uh, certification that I received is around integrative nutrition and medicine and for mental health and for trauma. And so um, all of those words put together simply mean that I help people discover and understand how food can help and support uh, their mental health journeys. And so it's been really fun to teach cooking classes, to offer workshops, uh, to facilitate experiences where people are able to more deeply connect with themselves and with each other. Um, and so as a, a solo entrepreneur uh, with, in private practice. Uh, I did not, again, intend to, to be in business for myself or to be an entrepreneur. Uh, as others have stated, uh, the pandemic has, has greatly impacted the way we do work. Uh, so I went from seeing um, clients in office three days a week 
to now seeing clients online, seeing people virtually. Um, and so that has shifted how I work. And I, I remember thinking some years back, I, you know, seeing a therapist online seemed like such a, a strange thing, but now it, it's the norm. Um, and I love the ability to just be able to help people right where they are. Um, and so if that means that they get to stay in the comfort of their home, or they're able to fit appointments in, um, in between their busy life and busy schedule, and we're able to work together, um, it's really uh, rewarding and it's, it's enjoyable work. So um, uh, in addition to navigating um, the pandemic, um, I think just being able to manage uh, compassion fatigue and burnout has been a huge uh, part of this work for me. Uh, so I've had to learn how to manage my own stress. I've had to learn how to manage my own um, life issues and not just in a topical surface way, but in a, a really deep um, and meaningful way so that I can show up, be my best, and then be my best for the folks that I serve as well as my own family and support system. So I um, and grateful for um, the way that my work has evolved and on all of the opportunities that I get to talk about what I do. And um, even to be here um, with you today on this panel, um, just as a huge advocate of, of social work, of uh, mindfulness, of mind body medicine, and of supporting um, more uh, African American students in entering into this field and into this work. And so just on the side, I'm also a member of the local chapter of the Association of Black Social Workers. And so if there are um, any social workers or any folks who are in the space that are uh, want to advocate for um, making, making sure that there are more uh, Black social workers and that we have access to the things that we need, um, I invite you to, to join us, the Baltimore Legacy chapter of the Association of Black Social Workers or ABSW. Um, we have monthly meetings uh, every third Saturday and we do have uh, open opportunities for students to join, to be a part, um, to volunteer and to be a part of the great work that we get to do. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna open up to questions now. There are a few questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll just read them out loud. Um, Ms. Roberts, from one question came in about postgraduate, or I suppose also post-baccalaureate uh, internship programs that are available to students who have either BS and or BS and master's. So no, there aren't actual internships. Um, to work in the laboratory, you would need when I, when I was able, um, I graduated from Wesley with my BS and I was able to work in, within a laboratory, but I was also in the medical technology program as well. Um, so you can just need a, bat, a bachelor's degree to, to get a position. Um, something like micro is a little bit more specialized. So you would need the ASCT certification, but Right now, if you go to the core lab or the chemistry and hematology, they're looking for um, people with bachelor's degrees that can they can do on the job training to work with some of those instruments. And we are very short staffed at the moment, especially at Johns Hopkins. So um, that would be an opportunity for you to kind of just apply. Um, they have a lot of stuff on Glassdoor, Indeed, LinkedIn, and a Johns Hopkins um, site to, to look through. Um, I think the other question was also to that, could you work um, at with your BS degree and work in the lab? I, I did when I was um, in school. Um, and there's different ways that you can do it, an overnight shift, the evening shift or so um, with those same criteria. You wouldn't be working on the bench um, because that's more technical, but you could do um, a specimen processing area, which is taking the samples in and putting them on the right media or working an instrument that doesn't need um, a certain certification to do. So like there's always a, a way to work within the lab, even if it's just customer service um, as you go to your next step. 
awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so yes, it sounds like if, if you have a biology uh, major or degree, you don't necessarily need to get another degree. What you can do is, is start off in the lab and then you can get various certifications while you're working there and then move your way up in the lab. Great. Um, so I have a, a general question for everybody on the panel, which is when did you first learn about the career that you're in? Um, well, Jerry kind of told us a bit about that, but if you can tell us, you know, when you learned about this career um, specifically and when you sort of decided like, okay, this is what I'm going to follow. Are you? I'll go first, I guess. Oh, you want to go first? Okay, all right, cool. So I found out about communication science and disorders at Howard University in December of 2010. I started off in journalism and because my mom wanted me to be a journalist, she thought I had the personality to be on TV. However, I was not passionate about journalism, so I switched my major to communication science and disorders after speaking to some career counselors at Howard. They shifted my thinking about what I should do with my life. And to be honest, I had no idea in high school what I should become. So having a presentation like this, I find is very beneficial because for people like myself, where they only promoted you to work at the plant or become a teacher, right, at the high school or elementary or middle school level, it was rewarding to have people to pour into me and to see things in myself that I didn't see. And so I found it at Howard by way of career counselors. And I never looked back. Ain't you? Uh, all right. So, you know. uh, <laughs> uh, and Ms. Robbins, when when did you? Um, how did you end up getting that first job in the lab when you when you had your first degree? My first job in the lab um, was from a professor um, in the medical technology area. I did really well in parasitology, which is like looking at parasites under a microscope, and he was like, "Look." we like you, go here. And I ended up working, um, going to school from like seven to four and working from four to midnight um, well, <laughs> for like a couple of years. And I really enjoyed it and it kind of took off. I, I kind of mentioned it in my career map story where I thought I was going directly into medical school because that's what I thought I was passionate about, but once I worked within a pediatrician's office and just like that patient contact, I, I did not enjoy. Um, so I kind of just went that direction and kind of never looked back. And I'm now kind of going into more of a finance um, operational role within the laboratory, which it's it's a it's a spot where you can just go anywhere. I have people who have gone to medical school, um, nursing school, um, PA school, um, have done stuff um, within the hospital too, um, doing outbreak stuff and working with um, other nurse practitioners. So it's a lot to do. Awesome, Jerry. Do you want to add? Yes. Um, so similar to uh, what Darius described, I had not considered social work, um, but my, my major was sociology, um, but I needed another degree program to fulfill um, my requirements, how, how many credits I needed. And so after talking to um, one of the, the advisors and one of the counselors um, on campus, uh, social work was suggested as a nice complement to sociology. And so from there, I took my first social work class. Um, I think Maybe in high school, I, I thought I might major in psychology, um, but I, I still don't think mental health was the way that I planned to go. I just, again, just wanted to help people. But when I took, took the first social work class, I loved um, how I could make an impact that was so big and, and really there was so much versatility there. Um, it could go in any direction. I think um, my first social work professor um, had like a background in law um, and, and then also worked in like child protective services and all these different things that um, just seem so fascinating to me. So um, it's, it's been no looking back and social work has been with me ever since. Awesome. So it seems like a theme here, two things I'm hearing. One is the advisors. So I encourage the students to use the resources at your institutions, go and speak with your advisors early and, and explore your options. And the other is mentorship. So um, I'm hearing, oh, somebody was good in a class and the professor said, hey, come do this. Um, mentorship is absolutely key. If you, the more mentors you can sort of gather and, and do your part to stay in that mentor 
mentee relationship, uh, it will serve you well. So I'm going to stop the recording so that if there's anybody who wants to ask a question but would rather not be recorded, um, you can go ahead and do so.